In the interest of time, we will go ahead and get started. I know we'll have some people trickling in. Uh, so good morning or afternoon or evening from wherever you're tuning in. Uh, and welcome to the Ethical Open Science for Past Global Change Research Coordination Network webinar series. My name is Natalie Rea, and I'm a postdoctoral research associate in the School of Information at University of Arizona. Um, as an FYI, we're recording today's webinar, and the recording is going to be available on the Neotoma YouTube channel, which will um, circulate a link in the chat near the end of the webinar for that. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm tuning in today from Tucson, Arizona, which is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, uh, with Tucson being home to the Fauna Otham and the Yaqui peoples. Uh, as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these communities. I think it's also important to acknowledge that the academic fields uh, involved in past global change research, for instance, geology, archaeology, paleontology, and biology, have been used and in some cases continue to be used for the destruction dispossession, appropriation, and disruption of indigenous peoples, lands, and culture, and to acknowledge that we have a responsibility to reckon with these past and ongoing harms and injustices and the ways they intersect with our work. Um, and so today throughout our webinar, I encourage you to reflect on how this legacy manifests in your own work, uh, your institutions, your academic field, and the lands on which you work. Um, for those who may be new to our RCN and its aims, uh, we're one of several NSF-funded three-year Pharos research coordination networks, with Pharos standing for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, Reusable, Open Science. Um, and our RCN is focused on building technical and social capacity by uh, supporting technical and culturally informed implementation of ethical open science principles and co-developing communities of practice focused on care and fair principles. Um, and so we're working on this uh, in particular amongst a number of quaternary uh, data systems to support ethical open science standards. Um, and so this is our PI team. We cover a range of disciplines and data systems. And if you're interested to learn more about our work in our upcoming webinars, um, we'll drop some links in the chat as well uh, to our website and to the registrations for the future webinars. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce um, our speaker today, Dr. Pedro Monarez. Uh, Dr. Monarez is the Recruitment, Outreach, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator in the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences at UCLA. His research investigates the biological processes that drive evolutionary patterns of marine organisms across geologic time and the role that the environment has played in these processes. He also studies the variation and reconciliation of local and regional expressions of global macroevolutionary patterns and perturbations such as mass extinctions. He attended California State University Fullerton, majoring in geological sciences for his undergraduate degree. And after earning his BS, he stayed at Cal State Fullerton for a master's degree and then split his time uh, between living in Panama, working for the Florida Museum of Natural History and working in paleontological resource mitigation in Southern California. He went on to complete his PhD in geology at the University of Georgia and after was a Stanford Earth postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Stanford University. In addition to his paleobiological work, Dr. Monarez has a passion for teaching and mentorship and works to, prom to promote a more diverse, inclusive and equitable discipline. And we're really fortunate today to hear about some of his research related to this uh, with his presentation, How the Past Creates the Present, Reviewing the Foundational Roles of Colonialism and Systemic Racism and Their Modern Manifestations in Paleontology. And so with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Monarez. All right, can you all see that okay? Yep, looks great. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for, for having me and, and Natalie for the warm introduction, also for the invitation to um, talk today. It's This is a, a project that um, took a little bit of time to go over and I'm gonna go over um, so sort of some of the behind the scenes 
of how this paper came to be, but I'm also gonna um, add a little bit more information um, to further support some of the uh, top themes and topics we talked about in the paper, uh, ultimately um, to keep with this idea and keep um, promoting um, this important aspect of how we teach paleontology and not just paleontology in general, but any sort of historical course or history of science course. Um, and even if it's not a full history of science course, but how we talk about historical figures in um, our STEM classes. And so um, today my talk is really gonna be focusing around this paper that was published in Paleobiology in 2021. Um, and here on the title page, you can see my co-authors um, of this uh, paper and, and their affiliations. And so this was, the, uh, we wrote this while I was still a, a Stanford postdoc, um, but uh, it's it was entirely funded through um, uh, Stanford. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the motivation behind um, why we came about to write this paper specifically, um, aside from the, from the more obvious facts of the importance of some of the topics we talk about. Um, back in 2020, uh, during the midst of the COVID pandemic and um, everything still being shut down, and most of us still working from home, um, we had a series of a... Um, sort of reading uh, meetings that was set up by my colleague and friend, um, Josh Zint. And the whole purpose of those meetings was to just get a chance for all of us to, um, get a chance for all of us to uh, just read a paper and discuss it um, with other folks from around the country, especially grad students from around the country, um, given that we were all stuck at home. And this is a way for us to keep or sort of paleo scholarship alive, um, despite the global you know pandemic we were we were dealing with back in, in the uh, spring and early summer of 2020. And so, of course, during this time was when we had the when the the murder of George Floyd occurred, and we had a lot of um, social activism and 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 protests around the country regarding um, the unjust murder of. Um, George Floyd, and not just George Floyd, but others as well. And so there's a big movement not long after that to have a day to shut down STEM. And the idea was to shut down all work in STEM and to spend that day instead to focus and reflect on these systemic issues that continue to affect us both at, at, um, in our society, but also within STEM. And so it just so happened that you know this day was June 10th, uh, 2020. And this the, sh the shutdown STEM day just happened to be uh, on the day of the week where we normally held our reading seminar for among our group. And so um, among those who were very active in that reading seminar, we opted to have a meeting to talk about these issues. And, and so instead of reading a, a paper like we normally would, we just discussed um, these, these broader issues at hand. And it, it was also a chance for us to discuss ways that we can get involved and what were ways that we can all do both at the individual level and also hopefully within our institutions to um, address these issues and how to move forward and making STEM more inclusive and equitable um, for everybody. And so in that discussion, we had, you know, we had different ideas thrown around about what we can do, and ultimately we decided to go with writing a paper. And so it was my idea to write this paper, and Josh put us all together and and put us into these small working groups to work on different aspects of the paper. And then we came back together, and I basically wove the whole thing together into what the paper um, is today. And so that's what I'm going to go over. Um, the next few slides is just to summarize um, what we talked about um, in our paper. And so our paper entitled, um, Our Past Creates Our Present. So a brief overview of racism and colonialism in Western paleontology. So this is an on the record um, article for paleobiology. And so on the record articles are typically on the shorter end of most articles. And so there's a lot of information that we couldn't quite get into just because of space limit. 
And so one of the goals for me today is to expand on some of the topics we talked about and just so just to provide further um, examples. But ultimately, the way that our paper is structured is we talk about the both indirect and direct roles that paleontology has on colonialism and racism. We talk about the, a little bit about the legacy of colonialism within paleontology. And then we, towards the end of the paper, we talk about examples of manifestations in modern academia, and then going forward, what we can do to um, address and mitigate um, some of these issues. And so the idea of this basically was to talk about how the history and how our disciplines were founded and how those inequities from the historical past continue to permeate to academia today. And that really is the goal um, of our paper here. Thank you. All right, so the way we structured it, we, we first start off with the um, some indirect roles in which paleontology plays in colonialism and racism and um, particularly within a North American view. And so that's, that's the other disclaimer I'm gonna put out. Mostly we're talking about North America here, but obviously this is not just limited to just North America. This is a, uh, it's uh, paleontology's role in, in, race, in systemic racism and colonialism, along with the geosciences, of course, is worldwide. Um, but given the fact that the, all the authors, myself included, are all from North America, we have a North American um, perspective. And so we start off with the role that paleontology has had in the extraction of fossil fuels. And so one of the big things um, that most people don't know, especially among paleontologists and paleobiologists, is the history of the Journal of Paleontology. And so the Journal of Paleontology today is um, well known as a journal that publishes primarily um, systematic or descriptive or phylogenetic um, studies on naming in, of, of new species. And so it really has a um, paleontological focus, hence the name. However, when it was first founded, the Journal of Paleontology, the, its main purpose was to publish about biostratigraphy and the correlation of stratigraphic sections for the purpose of oil extraction. And so it was funded through the um, uh, to SCPM, so back then, it, so today it's now known as Society of Sedimentary Geology. Back then it was known as Society of Economic Paleontologists and Mineralogists. And so essentially the Journal of Paleontology was meant to be the academic arm of, for oil companies, for how do we get um, data and how do we develop ways to better correlate sections to ultimately find and extract um, oil reservoirs. And so even though the, you know, it's very indirect, role, but essentially paleontology and the use of paleontology in finding oil only drove the disposition of indigenous land for the purpose of fossil fuels. And, and, and probably no better example of this comes from to mind than what, what happened in, in Oklahoma. Um, and were even among um, indigenous groups who themselves had rights to different um, oil plays, well, ultimately, that was dispossessed from um, by the government and and by other um, uh, entities. And so, paleontology has always had a, has had a role in the um, how oil the oil industry has grown. And on the other side as well, uh, the oil industry helped paleontology grow as a discipline. And it was a, you know a big funding provider in the early in the first half of the twentieth century. And up until um, the 1950s and 60s, really the Journal of Paleontology, that, that was the focus, is basically to help out with um, looking for oil. And so paleontology both helped the oil industry and the oil industry also helped paleontology. And so again, this is not direct roles, but just indirect roles in how paleontology is complicit in the role that oil geology has on the disposition of indigenous land. But going back further to talk about the direct role of paleontology in colonialism and racism is the this same extractive activity of removing fossils from indigenous lands. 
And so many of us in, in paleontology courses or earth or earth um, earth history courses are taught about the Bold Wars, and it's often romanticized as the gilded age of paleontology when you know men were men and they went out into the Wild West and were basically fighting each other for access to find um, fossils and, and specifically dinosaur fossils. And so what nobody fails to mention is that the Bone Wars were happening amidst massive expansion of the U.S. westward and the widespread dispossession of indigenous land. And so uh, these paleontologists would follow essentially the big um, uh, creation of the of the rail networks. And basically, wherever they were clear out new land, these guys would follow behind them and take, in, and, and take advantage of the fact that this land was now cleared off of indigenous groups and they would just go in and collect the fossils. And so, uh, and again, nobody, nobody talks about that. And part of this is also critical um, in the expansion of colonial settlements in Wyoming, Colorado, um, and Nebraska, specifically as um, these settlements continue to grow, paleontologists came in and were just digging over uh, and collecting all these fossil bones from, from these areas. And so, and in, in some cases, they actually contracted indigenous people to help out with some of the collection of, of uh, fossil bones. So um, in some cases, you know, you can give some credit to them. Like, yes, they, they actually were working with local indigenous groups. But for the most part, all this was happening um, as more and more land was being taken away from different, from, from different tribal groups. And so, but again, nobody talks about this particular history of paleontology and how it, it had a very destructive role in how today we see um, the history of, of, of paleontology. And so, and this is a, you know more uh, from a North American perspective, but to just expand a little bit and away from our paper, you know, we also have some of the evidence at the global scale and notably, um, and well summarized by this paper in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, published in 2022 by Nusayba Raja and colleagues, in which they um, looked to the paleobiology database to assess how the colonial history of paleontological sampling affects how our understanding of deep time biodiversity. So not only do we have a clear bias against um, who gets to work and who and whose names is attached to this paleontological work, but this colonial history of the way we collected fossils in, in the past impacts our scientific ability to understand and interpret deep time biodiversity. And so one of the questions that I get regularly when I show students this um, uh, map of the paleobiology database showing the, uh, the navigator um, page on the PBDB site, is how if you look at the global distribution of fossil occurrences, there's a clear difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And so many of them ask, you know, well, why is that? And of course, in some cases, there's legitimate reasons for why we don't have fossils from the Southern Hemisphere. In some places, it's, you know, we're talking about tropical jungles, and so we don't even really have rocks exposed. Um, but of course, for the most part, it's because of um, the lack of local regional paleontologists to work in that area. And the few data we do, we do have was not surprisingly collected by um, either European or North American scientists that essentially um, were conducting parachute science and flying out to these countries to collect data without actually incorporating um, any of the uh, local or indigenous um, experts. And so, uh, this, this study really for the first time quantified this issue that we've had at, of the effects of colonialism in paleontology. And so it not only affects how we teach paleontology, but it literally affects how we understand the diversity of animal life through time. And it's entirely biased by, by this colonial history. And so it's part of the reason um, for part of my, my research, I focus on the regional scale in part because there's a lot of mismatch between what we see at the global scale, given where that data mostly comes from and what the actual patterns were at a more local and regional scale. And so uh, that's, that's part of my focus for, for, uh, for driving that, that research aspect of my career. 
So moving on to um, how much of this is manifested in academia, and it's primarily manifested in the way in which we teach our paleontology courses and how we teach these historical geology courses, and ultimately just um, we're continuing the same cycle of emitting and not talking about the true history of how much of these disciplines were first built and, and structured. And so, for example, um, a topic that I, that I talk about in my classes is extinction theory and how we went about to learn about that animals actually went extinct, which of course very famously was put forth by George Cuvier in the late 1700s. And what you know, many people talk about the work of Cuvier, but they fail to mention where he got that information from. And so we, you know, everybody talks about the um, mammoth molars that he that he found from from um, from France and compared it to the to modern Indian elephants. But what they don't talk about is that Cuvier scoured the literature to look for other evidence of weird fossils being found in places where there was no modern representative of those fossils. And so, um, which this takes us now to back to North America, where um, back in 1725, the very first fossil that was discovered and correctly identified was done so by enslaved people at the, at the Stono Plantation in South Carolina. And so while these enslaved persons were tilling the land, they uncovered these mammoth molars and they recognized immediately that it must have been from some sort of elephant. And in part because the enslaved persons were, um, were recently removed from Africa. And so they were aware of what an elephant molar um, looks like. And so um, hearing about this, Mark Catesby, a British uh, naturalist, came in and um, while he was conducting a survey of the fauna and flora, of the southeastern U.S., he learned about the story, came in and wrote about it. And so he published it in 1735, 1736. And that publication, Cuvier found, and again, he used it to further support his idea of that extinction occurred, that, that animals went extinct, and ultimately led to the creation of his uh, catastrophism um, idea that he put forward. And that wasn't the only example of this. Um, just uh, uh, a few years after the Stono plantation, plantation discovery, there was another um, big discovery that was introduced to Europeans. And so it, in, in terms of the Big Bone Lick State, what's, known, what's now known today as the Big Bone Lick State Park in Northern Kentucky, um, that was well known and understood by indigenous tribes. And when a group of um, uh, French soldiers were traveling through the area, they were taken there by local indigenous guides and shown these all these mammoth bones that were coming out of the ground. And so they went back and told folks about it. And that was also published in the 1730s. And again, another that was another piece of, ex of example where Cuvier took that information and used it for his idea on extinction. But again, nobody talks about who who were the people that actually discovered these made these made these discoveries that ultimately would go on to change the way that we thought about extinction um, of animals. And so, another example of this that's sort of omitted from academia is the societal context of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And so, what, so something that um, people don't realize is that not long after he published um, his book on, on the origin of species, that in Victorian England, many high among um, the royals and those in, in, um, up in, in higher society used his idea to justify Western imperialism. And so they argued that um, indigenous groups were essentially biologically inferior to um, the white man from Europe. And so therefore it was okay to come in and to kill them off and take their land because that's, that's what happens in the natural world. And so Darwin himself uh, argued that he thought that all indigenous people around the world would ultimately go extinct because he too thought that they were inferior to the white man and that they would not be able to adapt to the, um, 
superiority of in terms of the technology and intellect of the white man, and therefore it was only a matter of time before they would extend. And so, um, and again, nobody talks about these issues and then within paleontology, but that's really important because how um, society thinks about science also impacts how scientists conduct science. Um, and, but again, it's not, uh, it's not brought up uh, in, in classes. And so, and again, and, and the last one, just to, um, just in general speaking about the, uh, the role of paleontology in the dispossession of, of indigenous groups, um, it's happening today where you know, people aren't aware of the different laws that are around. And so we'll often go into um, reservation land or tribal land and collect fossils without even knowing that what they're doing is illegal. Um, and so it's, it's still happening today. And, but again, um, it's not sufficiently uh, talked about. And so with all this, with knowing all this, how do we move forward? And um, that is a very um, hard and, and, and complex topic, but one that is definitely achievable. Um, and the first one is just to acknowledge the cultural context of the history of paleontology and how paleontology uh, is taught to students. And so one of the most important things and one that I've been applying to my own courses that I teach, especially here at UCLA, is to not only provide this, the cultural and societal context when talking about these historical figures, but also to talk about the people themselves as humans, right? And so it's very easy to, for us to forget that like people like Charles Darwin or George Cuvier, they were just people. And, and so we often put them, you know, we put them on pedestals as being these sort of big scientific heroes but while at the same time ignoring all their flaws that made them who they were. And that's important because if we just show these people to students, you know, it's, it makes it much more uh, or hard to, for hard for students to relate to them. When in reality, they were just people. And so, um, and often we don't talk about the fact that many of these uh, well-known scientific figures were very wealthy. And so that's the reason why they were able to do the things they were able to do because they were able to just pay for it. Uh, but we don't talk about the um, other folks who did not quite have the same um, uh, financial wherewithal to be able to conduct their research and conduct their, you know, their, their travels that would go on to help out with their um, discoveries. And so uh, just to humanize people is a way to just bring them down to our level and for students to understand that, hey, you know, these people were imperfect. They, you know, and I'm not saying to cancel these scientific figures because we absolutely should not do that, but just humanize them and, and put them within their context and so that students are aware they were just people and that perhaps too, they too, as humans that they are, imperfect as they are, that they, they too could potentially come up with the next big scientific discovery um, in their lifetimes. And so again, just putting these scientific figures off their pedestals down to our level to help um, students just relate with them better uh, is one way to, to, uh, to move forward. Um, and again, as, as I mentioned, to talk about the cultural impacts of his history on modern academia. And so academia in general was really built for the wealthy and so historically that's meant that it's mostly white men that have been able to afford to go to academia. And so those structures continue in place today. And not much of that is, isn't really talked about anymore. And so we, we need to talk about the fact that how our academic institutions, how our disciplines were founded affects who gets to conduct and who gets to be a part of that today. Even if, it, if it's, um, not necessarily direct, but more so through systemic issues, it still needs to be talked about so that students are aware and they're not completely cut off guard. And so one of the big issues we see in terms of tracking demographics of underrepresented groups throughout academia is as each step in the academic ladder, we get more and more drops in diversity. And that's because that's where you really start seeing the inequities in place. And so it's much easier to see it in grad school and as faculty than it is as an undergrad. And so just to, to let faculty or undergrads know this is how our academic structures were built would help 
and give them a heads up if they're interested in 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 grad school and so so they can move move forward and continue pushing our disciplines forward. And then to um, talk about the fair and care um, ideas to to paleontology, of course, one of the big one with fair and it goes back to um, the big data collection and how do we make it accessible and reusable and um, and open. And but part of that, because much of it comes from uh, the data collected from indigenous land, it has to like it, it, you're required to also implement the care idea into how we handle these data. And so we can't just assume and apply the care um, I, um, set of ideas to our pedagogical data. We also need to apply the fair idea. And so um, this is a great quote from a paper that uh, I, a co-author um, that I'm just gonna share of why this is important. And that given the history of myriad colonial harms inflicted of indigenous people, it is understandable if Native American citizens and governments are apprehensive about trusting Western scientists. So therefore, non-native scientists must be patient and thoughtful in their engagement plans and must follow through on, prom on promises of reciprocal outcomes. And so we often see about the, the care principles applied or, or um, wanting to be applied to geoscience data and paleontological data. But it's also important if you're interested in making that data just accessible and that they need that indigenous people need to be in the same con conservation uh, conversation. And they also need to be aware of plans of what to do with that data so that they are involved along in the entire process. Uh, but also, and more importantly, we need to just build trust. And we can't just go about this as a way to check a box for, um, for an NSF grant or what have you. Um, it needs to be authentic, and we need to build authentic relationships with stakeholders, in, in this case, with um, tribal groups and reservations. And so in order to work with them better and make our data uh, more transparent, in a way that's ethical and everybody is on board with it. And so along the same lines, um, going on a more recent paper published um, earlier this year, is what do we do with regards to um, using data from large databases like the Pillow database? And so it's clear, you know, and I'm, I'm just gonna throw out there for, for disclaimer, I've been guilty of this as well, of publishing work using data from the Pillow database, but not properly or correctly citing the source data from which those occurrences came from. And so in some cases, we'll find that those um, source papers from where occurrence data comes from will more often include a diverse set of authors relative to the authors who are, who are publishing the, um, the, uh, the data from those papers. And so one way to also consider uh, uh, not just fair, but also care and how we conduct our paleontological uh, uh, research is to be mindful of how we cite and how we cite um, the source data for papers, especially if we use uh, data from large um, uh, uh, databases like the paleobiology database. And so this, um, this paper, again, this is a short uh, um, on the record, article for, for, for pillobology, so not very long, but it does lay out some great ideas moving forward about how, how to get around this issue. And of course, it's it's hard, right? And so as any of you who ever used the PBDB or any other of these um, databases, we know that oftentimes, depending on the scope of our project, we might be um, working with thousands of citations. And so obviously, citing them each one individually in the paper is not feasible. And so how, do, how, do you, how can we go about um, giving credit to those authors and making sure that they all, they, um, we treat their work equitably as we deal with the data itself? And so with that, I'm just going to um, acknowledge uh, a bunch of folks uh, regarding these, the, this work. And so primarily, um, I want to thank the DEI Committee from the Paleontological Society. Um, this is a committee uh, back in 2020, 2020 and 2021 who provided really great feedback um, to on original copies of the manuscript before we submitted it, um, but also some other folks who looked at it as well. Um, 
Sarah, Maya, and John, um, who provided uh, uh, invaluable feedback. And then lastly, uh, Phoebe Cohen and Peg Jacobucci were both uh, reviewers for the actual paper itself. And so uh, again, these are just a, what I would consider just the tip of the, of the iceberg. Um, there's much more that goes with this. There's much more that I haven't, that I didn't get a chance to go over just for, for time's sake. Uh, but a lot of the way we teach and conduct paleontology can be improved to not only consider the history of what we're working on, but also how do we um, apply our, the fair and care principles so we make sure that, A, we are doing our work equitably, but also, and more importantly, our data is available to the people um, for anybody who wants to see it. And so uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Pedro, for that uh, nice talk. Um, yeah, do, are there any immediate questions from the audience? Feel free to um, unmute or raise your hand and unmute, um, and you can also place questions in the chat. Hi, Pedro, that was an amazing, um, oh, oh no, I'm sorry that I jumped right in. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I am um, a sociologist of science, so this was amazing to hear um, and a lot of um, discussions in, in library and information science as well, which is another area that I'm that I have training in. Um, we're, we're you know chatting about how to how to decolonize syllabi and also um, you know, like you said, try to humanize some of the um, uh, these heroes that we put on pedestals, as you say. Um, uh, and one thing that I, I was really interested about was if you could, um, say a little bit more about how uh, you said there were some implications for where data is not collected because there's not the resources or capacity there. Um, and I was I was curious in the context of I know for genomics some of the implications are for vaccine development and um, variation variant tracking. But I was curious in the area of like paleontology if there's any like current issues that you know of um, that are really affected by this this sort of lack of collection of um, paleo biological. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I'm not um, natural scientist. Um, um, in in that kind of context. So, but oh my gosh, awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, with regards to issues with with collecting data, um, in terms of yeah, so so for my line of work, for example, so I I, I um, focus a lot on mass extinctions. And in particular, on um, understanding what goes extinct, and and also tracking what survives and what does well after mass extinctions. And the purpose of that is to try to find a pattern um, among different animal groups, so that we could potentially learn from that history and apply it to those um, surviving animal groups today. And so one thing that um, in my work that I'm learning more and more is our ability to understand the evolutionary history of life is really dependent on the animal group you're working with. And so therefore you, we cannot apply sort of a, a one size fits all conservation plan for today and for the future, just because you know animal groups are different and they all are gonna react a bit and, and differently to environmental change, whether it be from um, you know climate change or versus more direct anthropogenic um, issues like over harvesting, overfishing, and 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 pollution, and so the problem with that is we you know the bulk of the data we use comes from the northern hemisphere, and so I don't know what some of these patterns are from say the uh, the African continent or from the Asian continent, because a lot of it is just missing. We just don't have that data. And so we often, you know, as I uh, work on these data and, and try to analyze these data, I have to keep in mind that this is not global mm -hmm. and that ultimately um, we're only looking at just very few overrepresented regions of the world. And obviously, as everything else, life is not going to be representative of um, just two regions because it's completely different everywhere, you know, depending on different environmental conditions all around the world. 
And so there is definitely a need to fill in those gaps so we can have a better understanding of how the global system reacts to mass extinction events and how they bounce back from them. And of course, the other, um, but even if we were to have access to, uh, um, to uh, ethically collect and incorporate regional and local experts in, in, in this work, we got to deal with the other geologic issue of this and that, you know, finding the rocks to begin with. And so it's entirely possible that for certain intervals, the rocks just don't exist because they, they don't preserve. And so, which is why I mentioned in that earlier figure where I, sh I, sh I showed the global map with all the fossil occurrences, there are legitimate reasons why we, there isn't any data for certain spaces. We just, there are no rocks available or... Um, uh, the Sahara. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, but of course, you know, there's also a lack of um, local experts to help with that. And um, one way to get around that, and I've already been seeing it, is that many PIs and other folks are actually in their grants, they're writing for funding to be able to bring in or fly out to uh, developing countries and train scientists to become local experts in their paleontology and then ultimately essentially have, you know, have them build their own program. And so it's one way we can get around that, but for the time being, it's gonna take quite a bit of effort and money, which unfortunately um, is getting harder and harder to acquire for, for, for paleontology. Um, but that's, that's one way to potentially fix that. Awesome, thank you. Jessica? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Menares. That was a great talk. Um, I guess I'm I'm wondering about one of the things that we've been thinking about, or one way we think about, you know, large data resources are that they're both social resources and technical resources. And, you know, I think that the recommendations about using our positions also as educators to expose to sort of put people into the our narratives and and the way we talk about them is is sort of a uh the start of a social solution right and i'm and then other things like sort of the maybe attribute attributing authorship and stuff you know on one hand could be a technical solution and sort of how we handle things but i'm wondering whether there's other like you know we can often like i guess it's that to me what i worry about or what like i think that training sort of incre increasing sort of the way and support for how we we talk about these issues and and sort of help train ourselves and our students in this is really um is really impactful but then there's also sort of the like when the rubber hits the road and you're working with data how do you know right what data like what the best way to handle a particular data set is um how do you know what information is even missing from a record, right? That that you, you know, and so I, and some of that is, is there a way or have you thought about ways of flagging maybe um, collections or regions or data sets, you know, that might indicate that there's a, there's a, a problem or a gap or something missing here that, that researchers need to be aware of, right? This is something we're talking about in our RCN. How does, how do these issues sort of transmit across the, the data ecosystem? And I was just wondering your thoughts on, on that. Sure, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, 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 it's gonna require, just from my own experience, a lot of nuanced understanding mm -hmm. of, the source of those data sets. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases it's, it's gonna require learning more about you know, different cultures and different um, countries and, and laws. And so uh, it will take some work, um, work that is you know, certainly uh, different from, that, from those that are typically conducted by, by uh, paleontologists in, in our case. Um, but that's, I mean, that's the best way to, uh, in my opinion, to go about it, but it, and it's, but it's also not the most practical either, just because it, it's going to take quite a bit of time, especially if 
there's a lack of local experts from a certain area where data are, data come from. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, uh, local experts on the ground um, that you can they can talk to about this. Um, and so, one way to that I've that you know going back to the Raja et al. Um, paper here is in, in that in that paper they did highlight where we have over um, uh, over over representation of certain authors and what countries are from. Um, and so, and I think that's, that's you know one way to start from mm -hmm. that. And so, uh, for instance, um, in Brazil, Brazil has you know a wealth of fossil data, um, but most authors who work on Brazilian material are German. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's changing now. They're changing now as as there's more Brazilian paleontologists and. Um, and as we've seen over the last few years, there's been work on um, bringing back some of the fossils that were collected from Brazil illegally. Um, and so uh, it, it's it's that's one way is, is to look at um, who are the people collecting it um, in terms of. But again, you know, that depends on, on really the, the questions that you want to ask, um, mm -hmm. because it, it's. That one of the tricky aspects of, of, of paleontology, but also any other um, science that requires these large data sets is there's so much potential bias that can be introduced um, by, by people. And it could be anything from, you know, as an example of, of one of these, um, since I'm an author on a paper right now on this, is um, how we collect body size data of, of of um, shelled animals um, and we could have a wide range of error in the maximum size of say a species entirely based on how a person measures right and so in some cases it's going to take a lot of just nuance understanding of where the data come from and what is the, what, what is the question that you're trying to address um, and, but also that brings, you know, that, that provides potential opportunity to reach out to colleagues, you know, for example, like in, in, um, in, the, so, in the social sciences, folks who might be uh, experts in a certain area or what have you, um, to provide some, some context that's missing. And, and so not from, you know, not related to exactly to, the, to this <clears throat> presentation, but just from my own little, um, uh, Plea, I guess, is is I really, like I really wish there was a more concerted effort to bring the social sciences and the humanities with the sciences, um, and because it's so critical, uh, in my opinion, to uh, bring in some of that information into our data so that we have the full context of that data and we can understand and start pinpointing potential biases to identify. Um, and so, for me, my ultimate. Uh, if I wish I could make this happen, it would be to just integrate this, the the humanities more into the sciences, especially into uh, paleontology. I hope that answered your question. And I, I know I sort of rambled on a little bit there. Mark. Uh, thanks. Great presentation. Uh, always good to see PBDB represented. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I sort of help run the PBDB. So um, yeah, we recognized that Southern Hemisphere bias really early on. We did this thing we called the 5% project where we mined GeoRef for like 5% of the literature with certain keywords in it and dumped it all in there and did this analysis. And what predicted uh, where we're finding fossils was GDP, which is, again, a legacy of colonialism, right? And uh, so even within the Global South, higher income countries had more fossils from them. And uh, you know, I'm not quite sure, you know, there's lots of things we could do about that. I think it'd be neat to do a more in-depth study and publish it, like you say, take out the areas where you don't expect to find them, do the ground cover or rock type, and then really like quantify this and say like, what, you know, by, by, because there's definitely less land area in the South, but even so, you know, like, no matter what, what concession you make, I think it's still, like you say, this legacy of colonialism. So we need to try and do something like that. Uh, 
The other thing is, you know, as someone who helps run the PBDB, one thing we've talked about, and I'd love to hear your guys' feedback or feedback on, is when you download, like say, a, a data set with from ten generated from say ten thousand references, that's a lot to ask anyone to publish. But again, we're doing this mostly electronically now. Our goal would be to have them not just part of like a supplementary bibliography. That would be fine as long as that bibliography is indexed. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue for the publishers. I think we all need to push is that, you know, the data bibliography is just as important as the paper bibliography and it has to be indexed or we might as well not do it. Right. And, um, you know, we as a data repository can say that, but we don't have the you know, the wherewithal to make it happen. But one thing we're thinking about doing is um, right now you can opt to download the references from which your data was generated. I want to force it. I want to say every time you download data, you get a bibliography. So that reminds you like, oh yeah, I should do that, right? Rather than just say, hey, you should, we give you the data and say, now make it happen, right? And we're also doing a, trying to do a cleanup of our hand entered data using DOIs to, to, cause if you've ever, I've actually done it and you know, a good 10% of the records need, need some serious help because people didn't enter them completely or fully or accurately. So it's a lot of work to do, but I think it's really, really important. Yeah, definitely. And, and thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. And it's, um, what I've done recently is what you said, is, is when I've published uh, a paper using data from the PVDB, I've had the list of references um, added to the supplementary material, um, just because there's no other um, way to do that. And, um, you know, if, and I, I, I could imagine that, it, at least from the publisher side, you know, we need to push them more, but also some of the data repositories like Dryad, for instance, um, they, you know, they already index data in, in script files. And so I, I would imagine that it wouldn't be um, that much harder for them to also be able to index, you know, a, all these, um, a spreadsheet full of uh, references. Um, and so it, in, it might be, you know, uh, uh, worth the trouble to not just uh, push uh, the publishers, but also some of these data repositories um, to really bridge this gap between, um, this citation gap that we have. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Megan, did you wanna unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I was curious, um, cause you talked a lot about education. What have you noticed from your students by incorporating this into your teaching? Have you noticed well, I don't want to guide the, the answer too much. I'm just curious. Yeah, what you've noticed. Uh, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that. Uh, what I've noticed is they're way more engaged. Um, and so, you know, so here at UCLA, I'm teaching mostly GE classes. So I have big auditorium um, courses. And, I, and so this past quarter, which just ended last week for us, I, I taught about the major events in the history of life. And when I talk about, for instance, the rise of land plants, you know, I can look over the, the crowd, the students, and they just, they couldn't care less, right? They just like, okay, we're gonna learn about how seeds evolved. Um, but then later in the class, when I started talking about uh, extinction theory and, um, you know, in, in this context, I mentioned earlier in my presentation about George Cuvier and Darwin, their eyes are wide open. And so they're definitely attached to that. Um, and I noticed in those two lectures where I talk about these things, that that's where I got the most questions from students. Um, and so they definitely are engaged with it. And I think um, for them, and, and, you know, and just going through the student evaluations right now, they definitely enjoyed that. They, they definitely walked away having an understanding of, the, that context behind the science, and 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 what I teach them directly is that our lived experience, our experiences, shapes us, you know, who we are in terms of whatever career we choose, and and that's no different in the sciences. 
And so how we view scientific issues and how we decide to address scientific problems is influenced by how we were raised and how we were lived. And so that's, that's the sort of lasting message that I leave with them. And it sticks uh, because I had a question for them on their final and it, it was 100% correct. Everybody answered it correctly. Um, and so I think it works. And, 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 and I think, um, especially for most of these students who are not STEM majors, uh, for them, I think they really appreciated it. And, and so, which is why I'm really excited about it. And I'm already planning on teaching a class that integrates the history of paleontology with society, in particular, the going into detail on of the psychological effects of the ideas of mass extinctions and how that impacts um, our overall well-being. And so uh, I think it's, I think there's, it's, there's a big uh, potential future for how we teach these classes and just involves incorporating some of these societal humanities aspect to it. So um, I would encourage it for other paleo science folks to do it too. Okay, well, we are almost exactly at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Menares, for this fantastic talk and for the great conversation. Um, I've dropped the links in the chat to our future webinars, and so we'd love to see everyone there. Um, and yeah, we will be posting this on the Neotoma uh, YouTube page as well for those who may not have been able to make it. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Natalie. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic.